Um, so welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of PUSH, uh, we'd like to welcome you to this webinar with Ryan McDonald. Um, so I'll let Ryan introduce himself. Uh, we're really grateful for his time and looking forward to this presentation. Um, just before, before he starts, for any questions, uh, if you could please write them into the Q&A section, uh, you'll find the bu button um, at the bottom of your screen. So myself and my colleague Bailey will try to answer any questions that we can on Ryan's behalf during the, um, uh, during the presentation. But for anything that we can't answer or that's directed to Ryan specifically, we'll wait until the end uh, to do a Q&A section with Ryan himself. Okay, so over to you, mate. All right, thanks, Cedric. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world right now. Uh, as Cedric said, my name is Ryan McDonald. I am the uh, strength and conditioning coach and high performance manager for Volleyball Canada's beach national team. Um, just a quick little intro about myself. I've uh, been involved in, in the industry for since about 2004, like most of us starting out as an intern and, and a personal trainer. As I went through my university career, evolving into a, a strength and conditioning coach, uh, and started actually working with Volleyball Canada in, in 2013. So midway through the, the Rio Olympic quad and gradually started working with a couple, uh, the provincial volleyball program in 2014 and the lead into uh, Toronto's Pan Am Games the Canadian Sport Institute Ontario uh, opened up and uh, we started to uh, become involved with them. And then I became an employee where I ended up taking on a couple of other sports. So not only with volleyball, I have experience working with judo, freestyle ski, and continue to work with uh, the provincial and national uh, volleyball programs. I've evolved into the integrated support team lead for beach volleyball leading into the 2016 Rio Olympics. Uh, and following that, I became uh, full-time employed just exclusively with Volleyball Canada since, since we sort of rolled over to preparing for Tokyo uh, through the Gold Coast uh, Commonwealth Games. Uh, recently heading into the Tokyo Olympics, uh, it's evolved a little bit more into a, a high performance manager role where um, I'm responsible for overseeing our sports science, sports medicine groups, uh, but also helping support and coordinate our Olympic performances with our senior program coaches and leading into the, the Tokyo 2020, uh, now 2021 Olympic Games. So it's uh, been a little bit of an evolution over time, but uh, we work with a really great group of athletes and, and a great, great support staff. Uh, beach volleyball as a, as a team, as a program is a little bit unique. Um, we have, we can only send two pairs per gender to the, to the Olympics. So, um, and they each have their own individual coaches. And then our next gen program or our development program looks at uh, preparing for uh, at the top end, that third team, maybe even that fourth team will still continue to prepare and, and reach for the Olympic games, but their primary focus is preparing for Paris and LA. Uh, in addition to our next gen men's and women's head coaches, we also have personal coaches for each of our each of our next gen teams as well. So that starts to become um, a unique environment um, where not only are, are you supporting 24 athletes, but you're effectively supporting 12 clusters of a partnership plus uh, their own specific coach. So we have some unique, unique opportunities and challenges within our environment, but um, you know, this is just kind of laying the framework for you guys to help understand uh, some of our decision making and how we we prioritize some of the the contexts that that we operate within within those those 24 athletes we have three primary training sites around um, north america most of our athletes are uh, centralized here in toronto um, but then we also have have a pair that uh, trains in vancouver and a, a third team that trains based out of california most of the year so um, we are already to a certain extent remote, um, for some of our, our Olympic group. And then, um, because each team is a little bit unique, their travel and competition schedules will also be somewhat unique in terms of which competitions we attend training camps, um, different personal, personal, tr uh, trips or personal, personal vacation time. So, um, they're, Unlike some some organizations or some programs where it's a single entity moving around to to different events, 
uh, we have a little bit more variability in our system based on which competitions athletes will attend or, or individual teams will attend. And then when we layer on, on in our next gen program, this, this variation becomes quite massive in terms of, of competition schedules, training schedules, travel, prioritization. So we, we have a lot of moving parts when it comes to trying to um, manage and support the athletes as they're, they're in these, these really different environments. And within our uh, performance services group or our performance sciences group or, or our integrated support team, regardless of, of which terminology you're using, um, our primary purpose is to be that competitive advantage for, for our athletes. And um, this is really the big part for us is maximizing their availability, availability readiness uh, to train and perform. Um, so from our end, we want to be able to try and set the foundation and, and help them be, um, be as ready as possible to execute their skills and their tactics as, as possible. Um, and similar to how a, how a pit crew operates in, in car racing, um, we can kind of set that, set those capacities and set those foundations and support, but ultimately it's the athlete and the coach out there driving. So, um, even with that variability of where athletes are around the world, uh, we still want to make sure they're, they're having access to resources and uh, tools to help them um, maximize some of these key performance indicators for us. Uh, like most coaches, I think we like to, to talk in analogies. And uh, when it comes to, to my approach, we think about it kind of like gardening. Um, I'm not a gardener. I think maybe this experience will uh, make me be a gardener for self-sufficiency, but um, what I hear about it is you need to have your components. So for us, that's our, our athletes, our staff, our coaches, uh, everyone around, around the support group as well. And then having those, those right conditions. So you know, when, you, when we're uh, gardening, you need the soil, some sun, water, time, and even stress. And that helps to dictate well, what that plant is going to, to eventually become. If it's, we're hoping to have some big sturdy trees and, and less of the sickly ones. And our season, we, we sort of are fortunate to have a pretty good transition typically between a recovery block in the early portion of the fall for, um, for the Canadians out there we typically end that around our Canadian Thanksgiving, which is in early October. And then we have a, a period of off-season block, which goes from mid-October through till the end of the, the calendar year, which generally athletes aren't in the sand. So that represents a really good opportunity for us to address biomechanical deficiencies, uh, develop strength, power, uh, increase muscle mass, uh, work on those base building components or those engine components that uh, will help support them through their season. Starting in January, our athletes get back in the sand and then depending on the competition block that uh, they've scheduled out, that can generally begin mid-April and, and continues right through until August. Just coming out of a season and a little bit of extra time, we can speak specifically about the 2019 season uh, just to provide a little bit more context, which was capped off by the, the 2019 World Championships, which were in July in Germany. Our season as a, as a whole, or, or our International Federation, has a concurrent model. So there are different competitions happening at the same time in different locations around the world. And the athletes will select which competitions to attend and compete in based on what, uh, what priorities they have, whether they're looking for points or prize money or improve their travel or optimize their, their uh, competitive schedule and how much they're traveling back and forth. Uh, so generally they'll, they'll focus on those competitions and uh, in 2019, our peak right there, the world championships in Hamburg, Germany, going from uh, the 20th of June to July 7th. And that helps us reduce a lot of the noise around uh, that schedule and starts to narrow in our focus. So we will identify those competitive blocks this past year because it was the start of an Olympic qualification. Uh, a little bit of a wrench got thrown into our general planning by having four competitions in October. Mm -hmm. So right in the middle of what is traditionally our, the start of our, our off season preparation block, 
uh, we had to have our athletes at a, a level of competitive readiness. And then, so we allowed us to build out our, our prep. And so, you know, that shortened our, uh, our off sand preparation by about a month, but we were able to, to accomplish most of our goals. And then as with, with every program, making sure that we're, we're allocating time and resources for athletes to rest, recover, um, regroup socially, emotionally, physically, uh, even financially, because a lot of this is self-funded by the athletes in terms of their travel. So making sure that, that we also build in some opportunities for recovery within our season. And the framework that we use for, for providing our support uh, is really based off that, that model that, that Tim Gabbett outlined in 2017 around looking at the external workload, internal workload, their wellness and their readiness and kind of operating in that cyclical fashion to, to try and uh, support the athletes and really optimize our, our outcomes. And when we look at it, the first place that, that we started was looking at the external workload. So trying to quantify essentially what our athletes are doing on sand and, and what are we trying to, to accomplish using a sessional RPE. So taking the duration of any session multiplied by the intensity to come up with that metric. And um, we initially started doing this with, you know, the, the Excel, Dropbox, Google Sheets, Google Studios. But uh, recently we've invested in Smarterbase to, to allow us to streamline a lot of our operations and, and bring a lot of stuff into a single database solution where we can visualize it. And then we've been able to enhance that that level of uh, focus or that level of detail by also being able to quantify the, the demands within the weight room, which is you know, specifically what we try to focus on um, for some of this talk and, and looking at the volumes the athletes are completing, the type of loads, as well as the velocities that, that they're ex being exposed to and making sure that we're being precise with that. So within our global monitoring, we we want to take this, we've taken this approach because it allows us to combine all of the different types of activities that our athletes are completing. So it allows us to, to a certain degree, compare apples to apples in terms of on sand, off sand competitions, leisure activities. If they go and do yoga or cycle fit or, or some kind of spin class, well, we can capture all of that to uh, a certain degree within this daily workload method measurement and uh, this gets just put on through their phone they'll open it up uh, the end of every day and just kind of log what they've done and, and assign a, an intensity and a duration to that the from that um, many of you may be familiar with looking at acute workloads so that's effectively just the sum of what we've done in a given week so taking all of those workloads and on a rolling basis dialing that into each day. So for a given day, an acute workload uh, in this phase range kind of anywhere between a thousand units and getting up to about 6,000 units, depending on, on the block and, and how much accumulated work was being completed. And from those acute workloads, that allows us to, to also just look at it in the context of how much is the athlete done over a four week period. So how much work is being done um, and comparing that to how much work are they doing on, on a daily basis? So, so bring a little bit more context to what's being done on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis to help us uh, continue to support the athletes and, and help minimize that risk exposure by um, proactively preventing valleys or peaks in their workload where they are they're either detraining or would be overstretching their capacity. So if they're doing more than their body has built up a tolerance to, um, that also can increase the risk of injury. So we try to keep them within an appropriate bandwidth of, of training volume. And specifically on when we get to the strength and conditioning side, um, like most strength coaches, I started out with these duotings things in, in 2013, um, you know, pen and paper, couple, couple quotes here and there on it just to, to motivate, but um, over time, we were able to evolve to a, a Dropbox and Excel system so that we were able to have a little bit more automation in terms of how do we analyze our system, how do we start to track volumes, loads, intensities, get a, get a clearer picture of what the athletes were doing and, and how, 
how much load they're they're being exposed to and also how effective are we being based on the outcomes so being retrospective in, in analyzing our phases uh, and looking to grow and looking to evolve and looking to just get a little bit better um, we've now integrated a lot of that into the, the push portal so looking at uh, a means where a lot of uh, the work in excel or, or the work in importing and exporting and avoiding duplications of files in dropbox and um, trying to sort of streamline everything so that it minimizes some of the back end work that we've been doing uh, and we can really focus on the analysis the interpretation and creating action plans to move forward with with um, the intention of, of improving performance and supporting our athletes better and we can also dial it right down to what's being done on a typical session so how much work is done in a session if an athlete either responds positively or negatively to that training session we can start to flag um, some of these key metrics and, and some of these key sessions to say, you know what, that got us a really good outcome or that started to move us in the right direction. So we can start to look at things acutely as well um, and dial in their training, especially when it comes to peaking and optimizing training. Um, the athletes will receive their, their program on their phone and, and they can just input their, their training loads and velocities and, and partner it with, uh, with the push band. And when we start to roll out the band, it also gives, allows us to have feedback on every rep that the athlete performs. Um, my approach is a little bit different than, than Scott's approach. We will, we will just track our main lifts. So um, squats, deadlifts, um, Olympic lifts, throws, plyometrics, pieces like that. Um, just some of our, our loads, when we start to track velocities, start to get a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, um, start to get just a little bit different when we, we start to incorporate some more of our, our prehab based exercises and stuff. So we, we focus it on the, the meat and potatoes of our workout. Um, and it just gamifies it a little bit. Athletes start to get competitive and want to, to push a little bit harder. And you know, that objective feedback allows them to um, you know, moderate their, their effort accordingly. And it also allows us to, to be a little bit more targeted with the adaptations that we are trying to get. Um, uh, any talk related to velocity-based training would be uh, missing it if Brian Mann or uh, Tim Sukamel weren't discussed. Then um, you know, looking at the, the, both the percentages that, that are associated with it, but also the velocity bandwidth that we try to operate in. Um, we don't do and spend a lot of time in uh, working on unloaded plyometrics. Uh, the amount that our athletes jump can vary between 100 and 250 jumps per session in, in the sand. Um, so really that end of our uh, of our force velocity curve is really well adjusted as a natural consequence of their sport practice. Most skills in beach volleyball need to be associated with some kind of jumping within a rally. So um, they're, they're performing a significant number of jumps as a function of just their normal practice. But as we start to go a little bit further down the curve, we'll definitely add in some loaded plyometrics or medicine ball throws, some jump throw, jump shrugs. Uh, a lot of our time gets allocated to sort of the big three and for us is barbell squat jumps, some Olympic lift variations and, and trap bar jumps and operating still at, at some of those higher velocity bandwidths. So it pushes us. Uh, and starts to influence that curve a little bit more and, and allows us to get that upward and rightward shift of, of our force velocity profiles. And to continue complementing those higher velocity sessions, we'll squat, we'll deadlift, we'll do different variations based on, on our athletes. Um, some of our athletes have some unique biomechanics, so um, we won't do everyone as a front squat or a back squat or a, a Bulgarian. Um, likewise, deadlifting from the floor, deadlifting from blocks, barbell, trap bar, um, we'll use different variations to suit the needs of our athletes. And um, for specific athletes, um, depending on, on what we're trying to get out of them in terms of minimizing some of the exposure, some of the stress on joints, um, during some rehab phases, we'll also include maximal isometrics as well, um, depending on the athlete, depending on, on where we are within our season. And the, that mid-range of our uh, load velocity profile 
generally is addressed with our, our accessory work. So we will touch on all aspects of that, that profile, but um, the big rocks for us are, are definitely in that speed strength and in that abs absolute strength uh, training piece and, and helping to educate the athletes. And it helps us with that course correction as well. So with that travel schedule, we don't have the luxury of, of always being with our athletes and having eyes on them in the gym if they're in China or, or Australia or Europe or the Middle East or South America. Uh, even if they're in North America, circumstance may limit our ability to, to have eyes on them for every training session. So being able to, to get that feedback within, within an app and being able to identify that bandwidth from a, from a coaching perspective during my programming, but then also educating the athletes that well, if your velocities are exceeding this bandwidth, we need to be increasing that load. Likewise, if we are underneath that bandwidth, you know, you're moving too slow, so we need to decrease that load to try and get you right in that mid zone. Um, and this is this is really important for me personally because when we arrive at a competition, or, or if if it's a competition where we're able to provide support, we want to minimize that onboarding or that refamiliarization with the athletes in terms of what loads they've been using, um, or just even making corrections like, oh, that may have been too heavy for the past couple of weeks because of of what what we've been trying to target. So we can show up in Hamburg, for example, four days in from our competition and, and bang out a set of uh, squat jumps exactly how we need to. Oh, there's some music playing in the background there. Um, sorry about that. But if we are, if we're trying to get our, our squat jumps, and here's one of the athletes. Yeah. Four days in from the start of competition. Uh, we want to limit some of the guesswork that we're having to do so that we can uh, be precise and have, have impact in, you know, we try to keep our workouts short and effective. So in those 40 minutes that we may be in the gym, we want to make sure that we're getting everything we can out of those 40 minutes and minimizing um, some of the wasted time. And then on my back end, looking at what they've been doing and, and how they've been responding. Uh, the great thing is all of that Excel work and all of those macros and all of um, the databasing that, that we would normally have to do if we were using the Excel and, and Dropbox uh, solutions, uh, that's kind of automatically been done for me by push um, so that I can pull out how much time have they been, been in the gym, active time, how much time have they been under tension, what kind of volumes are, are they completing, and also what kind of intensities are they, are they seeing across uh, a week, two weeks, four weeks, a full block. Um, and in some cases, so if, if you look at athlete two here, they're almost triple the, the workload or the duration of, of time in gym compared to their peers. Um, and that also allows, in this case, they had actually just left their app open a couple times and forgot to, to end workouts. Um, but other, other examples, they start to, to dilly dally or, um, you know, spend, stretch out their rests and spend more time uh, than we were, we've been kind of programming in. So it starts to become a discussion point around, okay, well, what are, what are we doing? Are we maximizing how efficient we are during those sessions? And actually, you know, if we look at the cycle, this is the second piece, but this is actually the, the last piece that we started to look at when it came to um, supporting our athletes remotely. Um, personally, because it, it was one that was a little bit more ambiguous to us sometimes. And, and secondly, because trying to, to identify how they respond, the solutions weren't necessarily out there for, for a program um, and like a, a remote centralized environment. So in the way that my kind of eureka moment, I, I commute a lot. And, and one of my eureka moments was looking at speed at, at my car um, as kind of that external workload. And the RPM is how that car is responding to that workload or how that, that car is creating that external outcome. So um, you know, if we think about RPMs in our and how, the, how hard the engine's working, uh, that's a heart rate measure. And uh, you know, similar to push, first beat's been a, been a great system for us to, to start using this year so that we can integrate when athletes are away, they can plug their heart rates into our, our cloud system and we can continue to keep an eye on them. Uh, and support them wherever they are in the world without 
um, having to log into 15 different accounts to try and sort of get a, an objective measure of that internal workload because it allows us to look at for a given practice or a given training session how are different individuals responding so if we have eight guys in a training session we very likely will have eight different responses to that training session based on what they're coming in with in terms of fatigue energy motivation but also where are they at from a fitness level where are they at uh, in terms of the specific demands that that session had like if we just looked at it as you did a 90 minute session at this kind of intensity um, there will be some below it some above it or we may be completely off in, in evaluating how um, how stressful that session was um, but we can also start to look at it within an individual and, and with both of these we can we use it to prescribe training after the fact as well so based on conditioning um, are some of our conditioning programming will be dependent on, on how much work in the red uh, our athletes performed during a typical session. And then when we start to look at within an individual's response even, the same session will have different uh, objective internal responses from, from the part of our athletes. So this particular athlete completed two sessions that showed up in our subjective monitoring identically the same, 80 minutes at maximal intensity. So seven out of seven. Um, but when we looked objectively at how they responded from a physiological perspective, uh, the two sessions were about a standard deviation and a, and a half apart. So 1.5 standard deviations between the two sessions. But if we were just looking purely at, um, you know, the self-report, we can, we start to see differences and, um, you know, whether that's the impact of heat, whether that's the impact of fatigue, whether that's an impact of, of overtraining or overreaching or, They've accumulated a lot of fatigue over time. It just starts to uh, give us a couple more breadcrumb, breadcrumbs in terms of supporting how do we um, you know, create a support network around these athletes as best as possible to maximize their outcome. And how are they coping with training? This is you know, a part, especially with this, with this pandemic and, and with the isolation is a piece that um, you know, really can't be underscored. And um, everyone so far has, has mentioned it in some degree is you got to know your athletes. We can't just be purely reliant on a number or a, a scale of how they're doing or an emoji or anything like that. You know, being able to know your athletes and when you're having a conversation with them, either on the phone, on some kind of voice messaging or uh, video messaging system, or even just in text, knowing, picking up on some of their, their habits, being able to know your athletes and when they respond to questions a certain way, start to, to have an idea of how they're, um, how they're doing. And then to, to help support that and help also just address, you know, some recency bias. I can't remember what I ate five days ago. So if I'm trying to look at, at how an athlete is responding over time to a training session, or a block of, of on sand and, and off sand or how they're responding in competition. Um, being able to have a long-term retrospective view of what, how they've been responding and, and how their, their mental emotional um, state has been allows us to uh, just dial a little bit more into our support and also start to, to look at the effectiveness of what we've been trying to do. And within this, this dimension, we use a, a modified Hoover McKinnon questionnaire. So it's a, a one to seven scale of soreness, fatigue, rest, willingness to train, how healthy do they feel? Are they enjoying training? How irritable are they? And how stressed do they feel? And the scale is an inverse. So a higher rating on any of those dimensions is a more negative outcome. So if your irritability is seven, that's the most irritable you've ever been. And, and likewise, if you're health is a seven you are as unhealthy as uh, you've ever felt so the higher the the bar the the more distress the athlete is is experiencing and when it comes to starting to just like build out a little bit of the the variability like we have our good days we have our bad days so do our athletes so does everybody um trying to to reduce that noise and, and minimize um you know, overreacting to single data sets. If you're going up or down, 
trying to sort of understand that normal variability, we look at a threshold of the previous 28 day average plus a standard deviation. And that starts to create some of those, those conditions where we'll flag um, that day with that athlete as just, you know, it, it's worth doing a little bit of a, a deeper check-in with them in terms of how they're doing. And um, just like everything, it, it doesn't provide answers. Just because an athlete has a, a high stress, that doesn't tell us anything. It just helps us ask better questions. So when I'm, when I'm seeing something like this, you know, we're not going out and saying, geez, you're just, you're all over the place today. It's, oh, I'll often pick one of, one of those dimensions that's a little bit higher than normal. And hey, like I noticed, you know, you're not really enjoying training today. Um, is there something we can do to help? Is there, is there something going on that we can help support you with? And that starts to, to drive that conversation. And it's a little bit more, um, creates a foundation for our athletes to provide um, input and information. They might just say, you know what? No, I'm just not feeling it today, but everything's pretty good. Um, or you can actually have some really rich conversations depending on um, what's going on in that athlete's life. And on the flip side, and this is something um, I have to give credit to Ed McNeely at the Canadian Sport Institute Ontario for, um, we can also use it really well to, to look at evaluating how the recovery and how, how our peaking strategies are, are going. So if we think about um, stress and recovery as kind of two ends of a continuum, uh, as athletes' subjective wellness improves, their recovery status is improving. Uh, there's a couple jumps we have to make conceptually, but um, as a, a overall pragmatic, that's, that's the solution that we use. Um, and it's shown up as we've gone back through it, uh, looking at, at different athletes' responses to tapers. Um, here, this is a pretty good example of when a taper starts. And over time, we see all those subjective wellness, uh, subjective wellness ratings improve as they lead into uh, their competition. We also start to understand that things like travel also have some influences. So if you look, uh, let me just get the laser pointer going. Um, if you look at, at these two days where they did peak over that threshold, um, that's the day of and the day after a, a travel across, uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. So we start to, to also just understand that and that starts to feed back into some of our preparation plans when we're looking at traveling to Tokyo for the Olympics or Australia for the Commonwealth Games or or even just some important competitions in Europe or Asia or South America, factoring in the stress of travel into, into our preparation plans has become um, one of our, our common practices. And if we look overall at this, this taper period, we see soreness goes down, health improves, restfulness improves, willingness to train goes up and sleep improves. Uh, and really worth noting for me is, as we look at, at stress, which is that top red bar, uh, it actually stays relatively stable through a competition. So as the games get more and more meaningful, our, we've created a buffer so that um, the stress of competition isn't sort of overwhelming an athlete and they're not experiencing more and more stress as they get deeper and deeper into competitions. So, um, yeah, this, this again highlights the value of, of having a rich data set. Um, for athletes that compete, complete it very regularly, we're able to um, make modifications and adjustments if they're not responding as ideally as we would, we would hope. And, and it also allows us to have those richer conversations the closer we get to competition. And building into that competition piece from a, a strength and conditioning perspective, from a sports science perspective, from just an overall performance perspective, are they ready to, to train and compete? And, and the way, you know, I, I think about it even just perform because I, I think the great thing about working with Olympic and potential Olympic athletes is they're always ready to compete, but are they really ready to perform at their best? Uh, and as I've already touched on, we look at that within the, the who from McKinnon questionnaire. We also incorporate a load velocity profile into um, our process on a, on a weekly or, or bi-weekly basis. So we can look at one RMs and, and mean velocity at, at their 40% one RM. Um, as our sort of two key measures of, of how they're responding. Uh, and then we also um, are fortunate enough to be able to look at 
their counter movement jump as as athletes that jump frequently it's something that that generally they're they're pretty interested in and how high are they jumping um, so we'll use that number for them but then we look a little bit deeper at eccentric duration peak velocity and um, we're able to use a couple of different systems to help analyze that as we um, navigate being centralized and being decentralized and traveling. So when it comes to looking at that, that estimated one RM and that load velocity profile for each athlete, we'll use five loads. So for our women, we keep it standardized at 20, 40, 60, 70, and 75 kilos. And then the men it's 40, 60, 80, 90, and hundred kilos. Um, we take their three reps at each load with lots of rest in between. Um, and we'll plot that to help project their one RM. So that allows us to, to accomplish a couple, couple key things. So on our squat days, it's a great way to warm up specifically for their squat session. Um, regardless of what they're doing, they're, we're not getting up to, to hundred percent RMs on any of these or even 90% RMs. So, um, we're able to, to have sort of a sub maximal warmup for each session. But then that also allows us to adjust their weekly training loads based on changes in their one RM. So if they're experiencing additional fatigue or if they're actually pretty rested and recovered and their one RM is a bit higher, it allows us to adjust those starting loads so that from the first set, we're being as precise as we can with our training prescription. And we're not wasting a, a set or two trying to get within the right bandwidth and get within the right, right load prescriptions. Uh, and then as a second piece, we, we look at that load velocity profile to how, what's their one RM doing as we get closer to competition and as we start to remove fatigue and as we start to um, get within a, a workload um, that reduces and gets closer to competition. And uh, similar to, to every other one, it, it's a pretty good stimulus heading into competition at a sub maximal effort. So they're moving each of those loads with maximal intention and um, it provides a very good way for us to, to load the athletes, to give them a neuromuscular stimulus without um, introducing too much fatigue into their system that close to competition. And then on the second end, we'll look at their counter movement jumps. So when we're we're centralized in Toronto. We are fortunate to have uh, access to force plates. So we'll, we have the, the force deck software right now with us in Toronto. Um, but you'll notice uh, when this athlete's jumping, he's got the band, the push band on at the same time. So it allows us to start to look at um, apples to apples when they go out to competition. So that, you know, here's one of our athletes jumping again at world championships. We can see, um, you know, how they're responding on the road because just unfortunately we can't travel with our force plates. So we want to have as continuous of our, our evaluation of performance because we, we want and we need to see how our athletes are peaking and performing as we get closer to competition. And uh, unfortunately with our schedule, as you guys saw earlier, it's just not really pragmatic for us to bring them into Toronto or into Vancouver or anywhere to test them in the middle of the competition block. So being able to have the capacity to test them at the competition venue, whether we're on site, whether we're not on site, um, has allowed us to, to have a really rich amount of data and a really sort of good way to look retrospectively at how do we support the athletes and how do we continue to, to help them improve and, and are we doing our job to, to help them peak for competition. And kind of zooming out, this is a, a pretty uh, 30,000 foot view of, of what we do in the different areas um, and how we, we try to create a system around our athletes to really maximize the support we can, we can provide and, and be that competitive advantage for them regardless of where we are. So if athletes are in Vancouver, California, BC, uh, China, Asia, anywhere they travel, um, we're able to, to maximize the support that's available to them. Um, you can't always lead a horse to water. And, and there are at times some athletes that may not engage in some of these systems, but um, 
you know, th those support networks are always available for them to make sure that they are, uh, they are getting the most out of their training and, and they are able to be ready to perform at their best. And really that, that system and that athlete monitoring piece and the preparation piece is part of a, a bigger system. You know, being a skill-based sport, being a sport where it's not purely the, the strongest, the fastest, the fittest that, that wins the match. Um, how our physical piece or, or how our um, readiness fits into skills and tactics and mental performance and fortitude and, and even luck. Um, how are we able to contribute and take care of our end so that um, the athletes are both confident in their preparation and um, feel ready to go and aren't limited by any kind of physical, um, physical pieces. And you know, at the end of the day, this is, this is what we hope to achieve. Uh, the 2019 World Championships was actually the first time Canada had ever won a medal at the World Champs, let alone a gold medal. Um, and it's worth noting that, that these two athletes are, are fairly high on, on the level of engagement with this system. So um, it's definitely not uh, a one-to-one -one correlation or causation, but um, you know, it's just, it provides us with, with more information to help support athletes and the clearer picture we have, the more information we have, the better we can can work collaboratively with the athletes, coaches, support staff to um, to really dial in preparation and make the appropriate adjustments. And you know, a great thing about having a rich data set and a successful performance is you can go back and retrospectively prepare an Olympic year based on the preparation for. Uh, overall championships are based on how a year went and make tweaks necessary wherever. So it helps us take some of the guesswork out of our annual planning as well. But it is a balancing act. We, we always will have a lot of plates in the air and making sure that, um, you know, we're balancing the ability to, to provide feedback, monitor performance, provide remote support, manage fatigue, um, take care of ourselves as practitioners and, and also um, tend to, to the mental well-being of our athletes um, and then something like the past four weeks comes into to the fray and, and really uh, really upsets the apple cart across the board you know the number of summer athletes that have been preparing uh, for July 24th 2020 is phenomenal across the world um, and, and this you know, has been a, a sizable shift in our preparation um, and the great thing about using um, push for, for certain athletes that, that may not be in Toronto during periods of um, physical distancing and social isolation is that we are able to, if you look at kind of our, our schedule for this athlete, um, have our normal training sessions and then uh, do some testing sessions as we get closer to or once, um, you know, the lockdown happened, the season was canceled we're able to look at, okay, how are we, how are we going to be able to adjust and move from here and shift into more of an off season or post season model where we're prioritizing recovery, but still trying to move the needle physically. Um, this athlete had, had access to, to her push band and to um, a space to do testing. So it allowed us to, to look at uh, doing some, some rudimentary testing for this athlete to benchmark where they were at. Um, for this session right here on uh, March 27th. And that kind of started to set the framework for us going forward. So even though we couldn't bring the athletes back to Toronto and, and do some wholesale testing for everybody, um, athletes that do have access to the push band and, and are in a position to, to start training from a, a health and wellness perspective, um, it has allowed us to uh, shift. And um, if anyone's a top gun aficionado out there, kind of do a flyby and uh, start kind of getting back into the, the pattern again. Um, so it's been uh, a great tool for, for me personally to, to help support our athletes, but also um, on a system level to, to really maximize how we're able to, to translate knowledge too. Um, we wouldn't be here, any of us, without the network around us. Um, I think that's, that's worth mentioning. And um, even though I may be a person presenting information, uh, a lot of these ideas, a lot of these these thoughts, or a lot of these these learnings wouldn't have come without um, the athletes that we work with, the coaches, support staff, admin, uh, even our peers. So um, I always try to take a take a moment to, to give some gratitude to those people and 
um, thank them for, for their, their help in this journey as well. So that uh, kind of wraps up my end of, of the discussion. I'm not really sure what we have remaining for time. Okay, 45 minutes, almost bang on. Um, if we don't get to, to touch your questions right now, um, best, best ways to, to get a hold of me are uh, either on Twitter or you can definitely email me as well. Um, but I think, uh, Cedric, do we have any questions in the, I haven't looked at in the, the question and answer area, but do we have any questions or is it kind of tackled? Uh, no, yeah, we've got heaps. Um, so, okay. you know, uh, so thanks, thanks for your time, Ryan. Uh, really insightful presentation. Uh, lots of good information. I'm sure that people learnt a lot too. It was really cool to see some of the discussion. This impressive. Um, so what I'll do is I'll start off the Q and A. Um, so we'll start with something general. Um, so during the the squat testing uh, at different loads, how did you normalize the squat depth? Um, we use kind of just visual feedback. We don't set, um, we kind of played initially with setting up some bands or setting up bars. Um, but because we're not doing a comparative across our athletes, so we're not comparing athlete one to athlete two to athlete three. Um, when we're looking within an individual, you know, an athlete who is six, seven might have some different biomechanics than an athlete that's five, five, six. So, um, the approach that we've taken is having them squat to their normal depth. And then we just maintain that as part of our feedback loop. So um, if they happen to, you know, miss groove a, a set and they stay a little bit higher, we'll loop back around and, and repeat it. But um, yeah, largely we, we try to keep them say squat to your, your normal depth, which for us is most of the time is uh, thighs parallel to the ground. Fantastic. Uh, we got a next question here. What does your interaction look like with sport coaches that may be hesitant to adopting technology in their game plan? And what does it look like with coaches when you see the red flags on your end in regarding to fatigue or acute chronic loads? Yeah, like everything on our, you know, our, our athlete management system or athlete monitoring system is kind of like a dashboard in a car. Um, you know, you'll have engine lights pop up warning lights pop up and we communicate that information and say hey it looks like this athlete may be in the red we may need to, to program in some rest for this athlete and here is our rationale for that um but ultimately again taking uh, i'm trying to minimize the number of, of ana different analogies that i'm using but if we take that pit crew perspective you know the athletes and the coaches are going to drive drive that car as hard as they can and, and based on feedback from us so um, we can provide that information, but at the end of the day, I'm not standing out in the sand in front of 20,000 people. Um, so to a certain extent, we have to, to empower the athletes and coaches to, to make decisions. It, depending on, on the situation, it, it can come, come up in debriefs after the fact and say, okay, well, you know, here are our recommendations. And, you know, we think we might've had a different outcome if that, if that recommendation was followed. Um, but likewise, like, you know, you didn't listen to our recommendation and, and you had a, a great performance. So that also provides us with, with a little bit of feedback to go back and evaluate some of our approaches as well sometimes. Well, great answer. Um, so we've got this question has been asked a number of times, so I'm just going to bunch them all together. So in, in general, how do the results of the vertical jump testing on the force plates and the push band uh, compare? Uh, they're pretty consistent. Um, one of the challenges I, I actually didn't pull up our, our data set on that, but um, one of the challenges we've had is actually on the end of the force plates, just calibrating them certain times. We, we sometimes lose a bit of sensitivity on, on the plates just because of the volume that they're being used. Um, but in general, we, we've had them pretty tightly correlated and, and we're pretty confident in, in those numbers, but we'll also never compare what someone's doing on a force plate to what someone's testing on, on a push. So if um, you know, one day someone jumps on a force plate and the next day they don't jump on the force plates but use push band instead, um, we don't compare between those two systems. We always keep it within system, which is why we have athletes jump on, on when they're jumping on the force plates in Toronto, we have them wear their push band as much as possible as well so that we can still um, keep things within each system. But I think there's a really Great good answer. white paper uh, out there talking about it. 
So the uh, next question here is, is how often do you give your players the wellness questionnaire? So they get it on a daily basis on their phone. So SmarterBase has a, a built-in, uh, has an app that the athletes can log into and, and they get a, a prompt every day in the morning to fill it out. We try to do it in the morning just because through the day, depending on what happens, it may skew what happens and some of the information may change. So the morning is the most consistent for us. Do they complete it every morning when they wake up before 10 o'clock? No, not always. It's kind of up to them when they, when they complete it. But for the most part, we try to get them to do it in the morning before their day gets going. Cool. Um, so you mentioned that. So one of the questions was, what is the compliance like with Smarter Base as a system and how do you ensure that athletes comply? So we don't force them to do anything. Um, it's not into our, our carding requirements. It's not into our team expectations. It's not into our, like there's no penalty for an athlete not using it. Um, and, and we can have different philosophical discussions on that. Um, but if we make it mandatory and an athlete hasn't engaged and hasn't bought into that system, then they're just going to provide us with like, they may just go across and put one, 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 one all the way across it and really not invest in thinking about that data and that information. So um, we don't force it upon anyone, but we do use it as part of our debriefs. So if we're talking about a competition that went successfully or didn't go successfully, or we have data on, on a number of athletes on a bunch of athletes that have performed well, but in the case where we may not have a, a data set or may not have um, as high engagement or compliance in, in SmarterBase and we don't have that information. Um, the way it's been put out is, you know, we have that information, we would prefer not to guess. And because our athletes are professional, we also don't think it's in their best interest if we're guessing all the time. So we want to, if they're invested in doing it, we're going to analyze it as best we can and use that information to help support them. Perfect. So uh, how do you adjust training targets or periods of emphasis based on individual test training data? So like in terms of uh, your KPIs, so like in terms of how they're related. So we use a dynamic strength index as one of our markers um, in terms of, of how do we fit athletes into those different buckets um, and, and training prescription. Um, so over the year, like as we get closer and closer to competition, we move much more into um, the higher velocity, lower load training with supplemented some heavier sessions as we get 10 days out from, from a training car or a competition. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is, uh, thanks, thanks for the presentation, Ryan. Um, can you share any experiences using push for return to training after an injury? Um, we haven't, you know, we've been pretty fortunate for the most part. Um, we, we have it currently deployed with our senior athletes, only the, the Olympic pathway athletes that are preparing for Tokyo. We haven't deployed it through our full program yet. Um, but when we start to look at um, that group, we've, we've been pretty fortunate when it comes to, to their rehab processes, not requiring some, some significant downtimes. Um, the one piece we will just kind of monitor is that peak velocity of their jumps as they start to come back, whether it's from an ankle or a, uh, like a patellar tendinopathy rehab protocol. And, and we'll kind of continue to monitor that as they get closer and closer to late stage rehab and, and as their jump uh, counts start to normalize again. All right. Fantastic. So, uh, how do you monitor and translate the carryover from power output from gym testing onto the quarter of the sand field? That's, that's a fun one. Um, sand as a surface is very challenging to put like a force plate on or, or any kind of sort of take our, our common understanding of um, force application because when you, if you apply force into the ground, generally you're going to get a ground rea reaction force that is equal to what you're putting in. But when you go to jump in the sand, a lot of the sand initially gets displaced or compressed. Um, so it, it changes what we get out of it. When we, we our, our one approach that we generally do is just an on sand approach jump test. 
So we'll, we'll put a, a vertex vertically in the sand and, and have athletes do approach jumps in the sand um, and, and look at that and try to correlate uh, changes in power with, with changes in uh, changes in jump performance. But again, the nature of the sand, because it, it's not always the most consistent uh, system to test in either, just based on how compressed is the sand on any given day. It, it's really limited our ability to connect those two really efficiently. Cool. Um, that's great, Ryan. How, how are you doing? Like, are you still good for a couple more? Yeah, I'm good. I'm just kind of hanging out in the basement, staying <laughs> physically distant. Like most of us say. Eh? So exactly. Cool. Um, okay, so the next one, uh, so we'll move more towards the A to C ratio again. So rega regarding the acute workload and looking at that, why do you choose a seven-day sample period? Uh, we just kind of used, honestly, we went based on some of the recommendations from, from the research in terms of looking at um, – a, a seven day period it, pragmatically it fits within our, our week as well we we operate on kind of a seven day seven day training week so with weekends off and five days training through the week so we can look at our weeks and snippets as well and, and try to compare you know, from a monday to a monday and a tuesday to a tuesday and start to look at those trends cool um so we've got a heap more questions about um how you apply the hooper mckinnon questionnaire um, so how, in general, do you collect the data from that? Um, and like, apart from the smarter base system, do you take RPEs from on sand um, performances as well as training sessions and weight sessions? Or how does that, how does that kind of structure look across the week and across the training, the training sessions? Yeah, so we have two uh, questionnaires that go out daily. We have a, a morning wellness questionnaire, which is the Hooper McKinnon, as well as uh, just checking quickly for any injuries and any injury status and hydration levels in the morning. Excuse me. And then uh, in the afternoon or in the early evening, uh, our workload questionnaire goes out and that's simply, well, what sessions did you do today? Did you do an SNC session? Did you do an on sand session? Did you have second practice? Did you do some kind of recreation or leisure activity? Um, did you do conditioning? And, and based on, um, which sessions the athlete has, has identified or has reported they completed, um, they would be prompted to fill in the duration and intensity of each of those sessions. So we get the RPEs from uh, each session um, in the afternoon. So it's separate from when they report and they do their Hooper McKinnon report in the morning, but um, everything's able to be kind of on the same day. Fantastic. So this is uh, just one last question here. So when you look at load velocities for lower body using squat, uh, how do you monitor the upper body in terms of med ball throw velocity? And do you find monitoring this useful for arm swing load? Uh, so a med ball, I guess I, I should have maybe clarified that a med ball throw is, is a vertical med ball toss. Um, so it's, a, it's still a lower body exercise. Um, and for those, for those exercises, we'll just, we'll use the, the push and body mode on the forearm um, and just kind of use it as a feedback mechanism for if they, they have a, a slower rep than one, um, just trying to provide a little bit of feedback and trying to maximize that velocity as best as possible. Um, and even just a piece of education around how are we, uh, what load are we picking from a medicine ball? So we're not necessarily throwing medicine balls. We're throwing them vertically using more of a lower body exercise. Awesome. Okay. So that takes us uh, bang on the hour actually. So we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, as, as we mentioned before, um, you know, if you do want to get in touch with Ryan with any questions that we didn't get to, um, he's included his, uh, his contact details. What we'll be doing is we'll be sending a follow-up email um, with myself and Bailey's contact information as well if you would like to find out more about PUSH um, or any other information that you'd like. And, and we'll also be including um, a recording link uh, for, on YouTube of, of the webinar so that you can rewatch it if you'd like to. Um, so Ryan, thanks very much for your time. Really great presentation. I know that people got a lot out of it. Um, so yeah, awesome. thank you again. And thank you to everyone who signed in and looking forward to welcoming you to the next one next Friday.